All right, guys, just like how Miss Sherry introduced, uh, my name is Hannah. Um, I do study the benthic harmful algal blooms um, down in Florida Gulf Coast University, which is in Fort Myers, Florida. I got my bachelor's over at University of South Alabama in Mobile. Um, I got my bachelor's in biology with a minor in marine science because I just thought that was a better path for me to take and everybody has a different path of how they get to uh, where we are. I will actually discuss of how I got here a little bit um, towards the end of this lecture. So I like to say a little bit about me. If Ms. Sherry also sees, there's some old pictures of me and Grace will also know some of these photos. Um, I was a student back in 2013. I was part of that advanced program. And I was also part of that Belize uh, program as well. So I did go to Belize and I did my research on wrasses when I was down there, um, which was really cool. I just not very big on fish people or fish in general. I preferred the micro things and especially at AIO, I did like that plankton lecture and I was really into that micros. Um, and then I had the opportunity to intern back in 2016. I finished my first year of college and Ms. Sherry said, why don't you come back up? And I said, absolutely. So I was able to do an internship for 10 weeks up in AIO. Coolest experience. I still talk about that program. Um, and then I finished up my biology degree down at University of South Alabama. I actually worked with bacteria down there. I've worked with sea turtles. I was part of a sea turtle volunteering uh, place for about two years where I would walk nine miles of the beach every day or have the car or anything and we would go look for nests. I found a total of four nests and three um, false crawls last year. And then I came down to Florida Gulf Coast University. I work under dark, uh, Dr. Mike Parsons. Um, he is one of the leading people of benthic harmful algal blooms. He is part of the task force for that and I work under him so I work in his lab and I also um, is one of his employees too. I work in a total of four labs currently. One of them I only have one other person in there and the others I do have either I work by myself or I do have a little team with me that works with me to help with the field and some other things like diving. So we're big onto diving. We're one of the only groups that does uh, diving in the Florida Keys. And we do take other advisor students down with us so they can get their samples as well. And what I'm doing is I will be actually recreating a thesis from 1985. And I will actually talk about what I'm doing and how I got there as well. So some of my talking points I have is, of course, what is a benthic harmful algal bloom? Where the BHABs are found? What are the problems that we're uh, seeing? Then my thesis and also how can you get involved um, especially getting where I am and how I got here and everything else. So I would help you guys out too. So what is a benthic harmful algal blooms? Um, so these are dinoflagellates that do not bloom on the surface. So unlike the red tide where we can actually see it bloom and we can feel it in our lungs and we can get all the uh, respiratory problems as well, they stay in the bottom. So they actually grow on substrates and algae and microalgae. So we can't really see where the bloom is happening. The only thing that we can do is collect samples and then hopefully get the enough cell densities or the cell counts to be able to count and see if there's a bloom happening. Um, unlike also with the floor red tide, red tide is a naked shell, so it's easy to break. And so even just a manatee swimming or a dolphin or a boat going through, you can break up those cells. These actually like the tough current, the waves, they like the harsh surfaces, they have this harder outer plate shells. Um, so actually when we work with them, we shake them up as hard as we can for the current and to keep them alive and transfer them. Another thing is BHAP has 16 plus different species. Um, I study all 16 of them, mainly. I study top three is the Gambardiceus, Ostriopsis, and Proversotrium are the three I study the most, and those are the three that we have in our lab currently. We also have Coolia, which is another species of benthic harmful algal blooms that we actually find right out here in um, the Gulf of Mexico, right out here in Estero or the Estero Bay, we find the Coolia. Um, they do grow on stable substrates, like I've said, so the microalgae, algae turf, coral rubble, rocks, and sediments, so they actually grow into the, like, the algae and that's how they will. So they don't free float in the column. Yes, they can swim, but you mostly find them, of course, on that bottom. So where are they found? Subtropical and tropical areas. So the Caribbean or Pacific waters 
Uh, we do find them. Here's a good map that shows where they're found. So um, Hawaii is some, and of course the specific waters. It has to be warm, just like how most uh, benthic harmful algae blooms. And our sample sites, the ones I study the most are going to be those Florida Keys and the Bahamas. I will have the opportunity to go over to the Bahamas, hopefully next year, um, to get my samples for my thesis. So I wanna actually break it up and talk about the three to give you guys a little background about these guys. Um, so the first one is Gambies or Gamber, uh, Gamber, uh, Discus, my bad. Um, so these are dinoflagellates, like I said. So dinoflagellate actually means whirling flagella. So they usually have two and they'll spin in a circular motion and that's how we usually will find them. Um, each of them have a different swimming pattern as well. So we do have to identify these under a microscope, not stained, not anything. Um, that is so we can continue doing our research. These guys produce something called cigatoxin. So these are very, very deadly. And they actually can, you as a person can actually get this uh, cigatoxin, which I will talk later about that. Um, we didn't know anything about gamma discus. We knew about the toxin, but it was not traced back to the gambies until 1977. So this is still a re recent study and we don't have that much data on it. That is why people like Dr. Mike Parsons and other Dr. Allison up in University of South, South Alabama are working together to try to get as much data on these guys so we can try to help and discover it sooner before somebody does get sick. Um, it grows on Himalaya, which is a type of seagrass. So we will actually go down, we'll dive down, most of our sites are diving and pretty much use this giant vacuum and suck up all this algae to separate it. And we actually call these guys the butts because they look like little butts and that's how we identify them underneath the microscope. And they're actually pretty big. Uh, their cell range is between 24 and 60 micrometers. So they're very big and we can actually see them under the microscope very well um, if you have a trained eye. Next one I wanna talk about is the Ophtorapsis. So like I said, they're dinoflagellates. These are not as recent. Um, they were discovered in 1901 by Schmidt and re-described back in 1981. Uh, we call these the pumpkin seeds. And this is another, sub or another species that we don't know that much about. Um, our lab doesn't really study the Ophthalmopsis. We do culture and grow these guys. Uh, but we mainly focus on those gambies. Um, like I said, we look for that pumpkin seeds, and this actually gives you a really, really good view about those plates I was talking about earlier, how they have the plates, if you look at that photo down there. And these guys produce the PTX toxin. So again, another deadly toxin that humans can contract and can get very, very sick from. The last one are those prorocentriums. Um, so these are the four, if you look down on the dinoflagellates, those are the four that we work with in our lab. Uh, my lab mate pretty much, and I actually went through 104 different test tubes last week and identified every single organism that is under that, that we are growing. These guys live on the epithetic of the seagrass, so they actually live on it. This can affect our manatees, our turtles, um, especially the planktonic fisheries, it can get into their bloodstreams and they can actually make the manatees very sick and other organisms. We call this one the uh, football shape and that's what we usually look for underneath the microscope. And their toxin is a um, okeatic acid, which is isolated from the sea sponge. Um, that can also, of course, get us sick. And then they also produce the dinoflag, oh, I cannot speak today, um, toxins. So like I said, another deadly one. These are the most common that we see in our lab and this is the most common that we isolate. So what's the problem with these BHABs? Um, like I said, they do not bloom on the surface. So they're really, really hard to see and it takes us to identify where they are. Not much study has been done on these. Um, recently, just by 1977, which is still a new study, unlike Florida red tide, which we have data back into the 1400s. So very different of that. Another thing is cigatera fish poisoning. This is the most common I'm going to talk about. It's a seafood toxin. 
So people won't really know that they have CFP because they will get this flu-like symptom. Um, it's also a neurological issue where if you actually touch something hot, it will be cold to you and vice versa. So it can actually affect you very bad. Um, another thing is it impacts over half a million people a year. Tourists, locals, especially in those Florida Keys and the Bahamas, um, they will just eat those seafood and they can get very sick. And it does biomagnify. So it does increase and I'll describe it next uh, slide about how it gets through. And this picture actually represents what fish do or have contracted the BHAB or the cigatoxin, and the ones that we need to watch out a little bit more, especially barracuda. A lot of people are told not to eat barracuda because it does have the highest percentage of CFP. So right here is a good food web about how we can actually contract the CFP. Um, the best thing is, you know, it starts with those planktonivores, and then it will get into the bigger fish, into the bigger fish, and then it caught, and we'll eat it, and then the humans will actually get it, and you can get very sick. So I want to switch over to, so now we have a little background of BHABs. I want to switch over to my thesis. This is what I'm studying in grad school. This is what I've been working on for the past year. Unfortunately, I have not been able to go down to the Florida Keys to collect my first set of samples due to um, the coronavirus. So it has set me back just a little bit, but it's no worries. I enjoy working in my lab. So benthic dinoflagellates are associated, or my title for my thesis, my bad, is the benthic dinoflagellates associated with cigatera from the Florida Keys. I am recreating a uh, bomber's thesis from 1985. What I'm looking at is determining the changes of the cell density since the previous study. So I'm taking all the sites that Bomber took, and I'm only taking four of those from the keys, and I'm going to recreate them. I'm going to test the temperature of the water, see what organisms I see the most there, and be able to do the cell density counts. I'm also going to determine what substrate preference, what I mean by that is are they going to be more on the artificial side of it? Are they going to be on the seagrass? Are they going to be on the algae and et cetera? What sites, what they look like when I go under, and luckily most of my sites are snorkeling. Um, so the question I am studying is, have the cell densities of benthiconfral elements increased, decreased, or stay the same in the Florida Keys and the Bahamas since 1985? Um, so I'm going to compare the, the counts and the sites that are coming up from the previous study that was done. And the two questions that Bomber has asked that I'm going to re-ask for myself is the environmental differences. And of course, are the dinoflagellates densities should peak near the channel location due to higher recruitment and cell and nutrients loading in these areas. Like I said, these gambies and other benthicarflagellums do like the harsher water and the harsher environment. So they like those waves, they like those currents. Um, so will they actually be better in those areas? So a little bit about my sites. Um, my sites are about one meter to three feet. Um, so they're all snorkeling, except I do have one that is three meters, which will be my dive site. And I have A, one, two, and B, which you can see in yellow. This uh, map is actually taken from bombers. And I also have coordinates, of course, to go off of it. And then I have the Bahamas, which is BR, BRMSPLADC. I only have to go over there once um, just to get one brief sampling. Um, we will be doing that hopefully next year. So how will I be doing this? My component is actually field and lab. I am more stationed into lab here at FGCU, but I do field stuff as well. So I'm going to collect the samples from those different sites that you saw. I'm going to process those data samples. So we use something called Lugals, and Lugals is just a staining sample. Um, so we're just going to put it in and stain them so that's a little bit easier for us to see. Um, and then I'm going to process those live samples for isolations. Uh, isolations is just a technique that we use in our lab where we put a drop underneath the microscope and we take a glass pipette and we literally just isolate it till it's its own little bubble of water. 
and then we'll let it grow. And because they reproduce asexually, they'll just grow after another and we'll wait until we can move them over to a test tube and be able to test them from there. Um, those isolations can actually give us a lot of data. We can be able to send them off to genetics and get all the way down to species and genus, or genus and species. Um, we can do their swimming patterns. We can use them for a lot of different things. Um, we could do light intensity. So I'll talk about all those too. And the other second, other part of this is my lab. So with the processed dead samples, I'm going to blot dry those algae. So I'm going to take off some of those algae, blot dry it, and count how many species are under the microscope because they do live in that algae. And of course, like I said, those live samples will be used for those cultures for further research, either for my own research or for somebody else's. Come on. Oh, sorry, my bad. Oh my gosh, my bad. So, like I said, there's diving. Actually, that person holding that barracuda is my lab tech. Um, he pretty much changed me and everything I do. His name is Adam. But this is a good example about how I'm going to collect my samples. Um, we're going to have the microalgae. We're going to sample in with scuba diving. We're going to do a fixation, shaking, and of course, come back into that lab and do those counts. So it's a good, quick synopsis of what I get to do. Um, so I'm going to do a data analysis on my thesis. So the big difference between that old map and this map is this one's GIS. So I'm hopefully going to be able to do something like this on my new map to show what sites I'm using. So this is not what I'm going to be using because I have to do my whole thing um, for my thesis when I defend. I'm going to do one-way ANOVA, two-way ANOVA, use primer to do all my comparison of the old data to new data. So what I'm going to collect, and of course GIS to be able to help map out what I'm doing. Um, so why is this research important? This is a very common topic that we hear about in grad school. The first thing that we always get asked is, why should we really care about this research? Um, so this research is actually very important. Um, my thesis was gifted to me by my advisor, because most people are either field or lab, not a lot of people are both. And it's to give scientists an updated version of the cell densities in the area that have been previous study. No, we have done the cell density since 1985, so we're going to get an updated version because of my thesis. Um, also, which species are found in certain areas upon which substrates they're growing on. So each site I get to go on, I get to see which species was most abundant, whether the Gambies, the Ostriosis, um, and I get to actually report that back. I also get to see how the sites changed and has the temperature increased since 1985. Um, a lot of the sites that Bomber reported were under construction and we have looked back on Google Maps and they're no longer under construction. So could that affect the cell densities? Um, and then of course, every thesis always have that outreach of why this is also important. This will also help inform fish markets and restaurants that there's a bloom from the fish that they're collecting. It's making fishermen know about the current bloom and make them not catch the fish that are most prone for the CFP. And also it will help inform the public about CFP. Not a lot of people know about this and more people that know, more people will be aware. So what else I do as a grad student? Not only do I work on this thesis, but I also work on abundance of things in all my labs. Um, and one thing that we're working on which I'm happy to discuss a little bit more, I have my hand into this one, is the Rink to Reef project that is through FGCU. And what we do is we take old hockey sticks um, that have either broken or are not good to be sold, and we actually make them into artificial oyster reefs. Um, so we will build them and we'll actually deploy them and oysters will grow. And one oyster filters out 50 gallons of uh, seawater a day. So they're very important in our Acero Bay, especially with our Florida red tie, it can help with all that. Another thing I do is I rescue manatees, dolphins, and turtles. Uh, two weeks ago, I was on this really cool manatee rescue uh, with a 950 pound manatee. 
Um, he is now currently at SeaWorld getting treatment for his uh, boat wounds. He could not sink. Uh, another thing I work on is Florida red tide. If there is a bloom, we get handed samples and I have to sit there and count them, identify them and tell them where they are. This data can go out to the state. I do cell counts and microscopy. So if a sample comes in and we don't know what's going to happen, they usually hand me the samples and I tell them what's in there. If there's a bloom that they're unsure about, then I will actually tell them what's in there. Another thing I do is I work on the summer camp. So our Marine field station does have a summer camp. Unfortunately, we did get canceled this year, but I do run that. So next year we will be running our summer camp. And I also do education out here. So some things that we do every year is we have high school students come through our lab and I get to educate them about our water systems, about how to be a marine scientist for a day. So they get to spend out the day with me. We also do tours and everything else to help try to get people interested in this field. So like I said, I, have worked in four, I work in four labs. So I work in our marine lab and I work on our campus lab. In our HABS lab, we do culturing, which you can see right on in there. Um, so we take those, like we have right now 98 culture vials that we have to transfer and make sure that they stay alive so we can be sent out. Microscopy, um, either identifying our samples or somebody else's sample. And 2A is just another type of chemical that we use. We also do different experiments like light intensity and grazing behavior, seeing if snails and sea urchins graze on our gambies. And also a good question is how to get involved or like how I got where I am today. Um, I was not very good at standardized testing, um, but I was able to get to where I am, um, especially through volunteering. I've worked with Share the Beach, which is a turtle organization. It is big on that. I volunteer at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. Anywhere, any lab I can get into, I did in undergrad and high school. Uh, like I said, volunteer, work in a lab, once you get into college, it doesn't hurt to be like, hey, can I please have, um, can I please learn in your lab? Uh, we right now have a high school student, he's 17, he's about to go to Stanford. Um, he has been in my lab for four years, and he reached out and was able to get into our, our lab, reach out and connect. And of course, AIO is a great resource to have, they know a lot of people, and going there too, um, made me be able to meet those connections and also educate yourself too it's like if you're interested in plankton learn about plankton email professors uh you're welcome to email me i'm happy to discuss about plankton because that's my thing now and there's some organizations i've worked with i've worked with noaa dolphin island sea lab is where i did my undergrad and right now i'm at vester um i want to say a special thanks to Ms. sherry of course giving me this opportunity to speak about what i study and also uh, letting me come back as an intern, Dr. Mark, uh, Mike Parson, who is my advisor, and of course the Parsons Lab, who I work under. And there's my questions. Excellent. I'm glad you did come back. That was very good. <laughs> but thank you for doing this. This is really kind. So Anish, hi, hi Anish, good to see you. He uh, asks, is it is the only way for people to get the toxins by eating fish? So this one, currently, yes. Um, this toxin we cannot cook off or we cannot um, freeze off so it is very scary we we can also test the fish so there's a uh, fish analyze up in Dolphin Island Sea Lab um, so they take the fish and they see how much toxins is in that fish so right now yes okay and there is some uh, right the Florida uh, Carina Brevis you can mm -hmm. I've heard you can breathe that one in yes because that one's a a blooming one so that one blooms on the surface so that's how great like when we have the really bad red tide we can actually feel it in our lungs um i had to go get a manatee out of the mangroves during the full bloom in 2019 and i jumped in not thinking about it and i was just covered in red dots from the red tide so red tide's completely different from here because it does bloom this one stays on the surface yeah, I'd, I'd heard that people with asthma in particular had real difficulty with it, so. Uh, Bruce, <clears throat> Bruce is here. Hi, Bruce. And he's asking, what's the most dangerous marine algae? 
honestly, I think they're all pretty bad. I'm not really <laughs> sure uh, what they are, like which one is the most dangerous. I would have to do a little bit more research on that. But they're all pretty bad. You know, you got the, uh, the, oh my God, the oyster one, and all of them produce different toxins in different sea organisms. Mm -hmm. So they're all pretty bad. It just depends on the human body really and how you affect against uh, with it too. Okay, makes sense. Um, I guess my question is, um, what do you hope to do with this research now? I mean, are you going to move on to a PhD and keep studying this? Do you hope, I heard, I know you explained you were going to, you know, hopeful, hopefully for fishermen and pass it on to anybody selling seafood, certainly. Um, are there ways we can tell people to, to, are there ways we can help prevent this or make it better? That's what we're working on right now is how to prevent this. Um, that's why my thesis, of course, is very important right now to get out there. Mm -hmm. So we can see where it's blooming and what fish it's really going or like barracuda don't don't eat a barracuda um you will probably get cfp if you eat barracuda right now hmm. okay. um so, so it's, it's more we gotta just keep it doing like, research on it it's so new like public so a lot of it's going to be public education of telling people what not to eat what to eat um but it's not coming i mean it's is it worsening because of what people are putting in the water I mean, is there any, is fertilizer helping to cause, I mean, are there blooms that are being caused by that or no? This is just something that's naturally occurring. It's naturally occurring, but it doesn't help that our temperatures are warming, of course, and the fertilizer and the more coming in. So everything's taking effect. Um, it's not really helping us, but it's okay. just more, we got to keep doing research. We got to educate the public about this. Um, most people don't know about it. And most people do take vacations at the Florida Keys. Um, yeah, no, you're right. And actually, it'll be really interesting to see what you come up with uh, compared to the last study versus water temperature. Mm -hmm. Like to see, is it worse? Is it better? Is it different? Are there different types of organisms there? So, uh, Sevi is asking, can you contract it from marine creatures outside of fish? Absolutely. There's the ones that are maybe not CFP because that's the fish poisoning, but there's mm -hmm. the uh, shellfish poisoning. So you can get it from shellfish. There's the oyster, or, yeah, so you can get it from most marine organisms, surprisingly. Um, filter feeders, I would stay away from filter feeders. We usually tell people to stay away from filter feeders just because they're the ones that are taking all this toxin, all this nastiness and filtering it up. They're very good. That's why that ring to reef is very important out here. But you don't know what they're filtering. You don't know what's in our water. Um, hmm. So you mean in general or are there certain times of the year? They certain should avoid times them? of the year. You really shouldn't know where your oysters come from to know what's going on. So is it summer? Like summer's worse? Springs? I would not do it in the summer. <laughs> Most definitely okay. not. I would not do okay. it during a red tide bloom. Like we don't harvest oysters out here anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Just because we do have that Florida red tide and we also have a low oyster population here, but they do come from Louisiana and Texas. So you really just want to watch it. So long photo periods when you've got a lot of blooming going on is not, not the best time. Exactly. If you see that it's blooming or the dead zone has actually gotten bigger, you might want to just stay off from oysters for just a little bit and then come back when it's safe. Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you. It looks like that's all the questions. That was wonderful. We really appreciate it. And just so everyone knows, we're going to, um, uh, Hannah recorded this, so I'm going to put this up at the YouTube channel. So if there's anyone that you think would want to see it or you want to share it, 